Um, so with the snow day, it feels like it's been a while since we've looked at some of this stuff. So let's um, quickly review where we were last class. Um, I will go back to that prior handout. If anyone needs a copy of that, uh, let me know. I've got a few spares up here from, from last week. So there's four types of LP models that we're looking at here. Allocation models is, um, was one that we were looking at where you've got a finite amount of resources and competing needs for those resources. And what an allocation model will do is split up those resources in s with respect to some objective function. And typically, again, when, you, when you're not sure what an objective function to use, use profit. So I gave some examples here of last time where you've got a finite amount of land and you want to split it up for use to, um, for timber, for grazing, for recreational use. You'll make a certain amount of money from each one of those and there will be constraints that you need have a certain amount that must go for timber, some that must go for grazing. And what the allocation model will do is the search variables will tell you how to allocate that resource. A blending model, uh, you'll recall from last week, is the opposite. Where allocation takes a resource and splits it up, a blending model takes a variety of resources and tells you how you should combine them. So how much of each material should you blend to get a final product. And we went through an example like that, in fact. Um, the Swedish steel example was one I had encouraged you to download the GAMS code. Uh, so Rardin, whose textbook I'm basing this course on, um, he, he has made available GAMS code for all the solutions in the, his textbook, and there's the link to it. And this um, table is that one example of where the steel company is trying to blend a variety of sources of scrap. So first, second, third, fourth scrap, they've got pure nickel, pure chromium, and pure molybdenum available, and they're blending that. They have some constraints, certain limited availabilities of the first two scraps, as well as costs. Right, so some of those pure metals, chromium, nickel, molybdenum, high, high cost. Now, we went through and set up that problem, and um, I, we left it at, at that point for you, and I encouraged you to go to GAMS and solve that yourself, and then go download the Rardin solution to check your answer. Okay, so that's still, um, still something that I hope you've had a chance to do. We ended off the class uh, last time by saying that many properties blend linearly. Um, and one example of that for, um, is octane numbers. We, we went through an example like that. So you say, if you blend a certain amount, x1, x2, x3, and each of these have an octane number. So let's call it uh, p1 is some constant that represents that octane number. p2 represents the octane value for material 3. And p3 is the octane number for species 3. That gets you the blended octane value. And P4, X4 is your blend. Okay, And we spent a little bit of time last week to emphasize that you should write it in this way. It's tempting to bring this X4 out here and divide through by X4, where X4 is the sum of the species you're blending. Right? So you can see this sort of like... If you don't want, if, you, if the idea of octane blending like this doesn't jump out at you, think of it something like a mole fraction, right? So you're summing up various fractions to get a total amount, right? So when you specify it here with x4 in the denominator, that creates a problem because you've now got a nonlinear function. But bringing x4 over here to the other side creates a linear function for you. And what you'll typically find is that your blend will have a constraint that P4 must be between some upper and lower bound. Okay, so your blend value must land up in that range. Yeah. Uh, is X4 X1 plus X2 plus X3? Yeah, so X4 would be your, your sum. Okay. Um, can you just move that over and make it equal to zero and then put that into GAMS or no? Put X4 equal to... You just subtract the last item from the right Yeah, so you can write it in GAMS like this. Internally, GAMS will do this. Right, so you, you're welcome to write it like that. GAMS will do it anyway for you. Okay. So blends 
blends typically will scale linearly, and that's a typical blend type of equation that we see there. Okay, so that was um, where we ended off last class, and the uh, next assignment will have a blending problem in, in there for you to try out, but you've got one here already on this handout to, to try practice with. We also um, wanted to then consider the last two types of problems, planning and, and scheduling. So this is new. Um, this is the second page of the handout from last week that we did not complete. Uh, for those of you that walked in late, there's some spares up here at the front. Now, planning models are um, a new type of model. And in fact, the current assignment that you're working on, those, both those problems are planning type models, right? So in specifically, the, um, the one where you've got factory A, factory B, and you've got grinding and polishing, right? you're planning how much material to produce in each of these factories. So it's the same idea here. We've got two types of feed coming into this company that's producing three types of products. So how much of each feed do you need to buy from which suppliers? Um, here I've illustrated just one factory, but if you had two or three factories, you might send certain amounts of feed one and two to each factory in different, different values of the, that feed amount. And then you're producing certain products. Product one, two, and three is produced at one of the factories. Product one, two, and three is also produced at another factory. Right? So what I'm hoping you start to see is the sort of global scope of companies. They have the same type of factory in multiple locations. Different countries, different states, different provinces. But each of these factories are capable of producing the same amount of products. Some factories do product one perhaps more efficiently. Another factory for that same company might really specialize and do product two um, really well. But the point is that that's exactly what you're going to optimize. Your, your planning is how much material do you send to which factories and how much of those products should they produce to get an optimum. And what you'll typically see these planning models come out in um, this is a new, a new feature that's um, maybe not so entirely new because you've already seen it in the current assignment. But we're going to develop models that get very, very subscripted on the X. So X is the decision that you're making. And here I'm, just, I'm going to step this up now. Cu currently, we've just looked at variables like X1 or X2 or X3. But now we're going to get Xs that have two subscripts, I and J or in this example, I'm calling them P and M. Right? So GAMS is now going to solve for a whole extra number of decision variables. So here, in this particular example, I'm deciding how much product to produce at which site M. So two subscripts, which product and at which site. Now, when we set this up in GAMS, Many of you have seen some of how you've been working on assignment three, is you create um, individual variables for each one, right? So you call this maybe factory A and amount of, of grinding, right? So you can, you can set it up that in a, in a messy way, but GAMS actually allows you to do this efficiently. Let me show you how. It does it with sets. So let me use this fictitious example where we're producing 16 products. Now you could go write and create variable product one, product two, product three, but GAMS can do this automatically for you. You say set P, you give it a name, whatever you like, here I've called it product, and then in that definition you put one multiplication symbol, the first entry and then the last entry. And those have to be numeric. So GAMS will take that and expand that to product one, two, three, up to 16. So you've created a vector of 16 elements over there. Create another set. This time, rather than let GAMS create them automatically, I'm, I would like the set to have slightly more descriptive names. These are names of various cities or locations where the mill is. And here I've got four locations. So instead of writing one times four, I can actually just use comma-separated entries to indicate the names of the sites. Now, each site can produce that product at a different cost. And GAMS allows this fairly free-form definition here for you. So table is a GAMS keyword. Site cost is a variable that you've created. We're going to tell GAMS this is a new variable, but
but it's a matrix type variable with subscripts P and M. And that P and M matches the P and M that I defined earlier. So if I called that uh, B and C, for example, I would use B and C here. So those must match exactly. The next part that's in quotation marks is up to you to, to specify. So um, here I've called that unit cost of P, of product P at site M. And you specify that in a regular grid type manner. The blanks indicate that that, that particular site, for example, um, New Carlisle does not produce product 7 and 8, 15 and 16. So that's essentially a zero. And you could go put a zero there or just leave it blank and GAMS will fill in the zero for you. Okay, so you now have a matrix of costs for each site. The next thing we want to tell GAMS is to define a variable, a variable that has multiple products at these four sites. So since P is a vector of 16 elements and M is a vector of four elements, that's a 16 by four search space. So you've created all of those 16 by four search variables in one single line very efficiently. Now, the next line free variable is defining a variable called cost. Um, that you've used before in GAMS. You've defined equations before in GAMS. And here I'm just going to show you one particular equation. The objective function cost is equal to the sum of all the costs at each site multiplied by the products produced at that site. Mm -hmm. Now that's a long thing if you wrote it out by hand. So we use the GAMS function called sum. And sum has two parts to it. The first part tells you the indexes which to sum over. So this is summing over both the indexes of P and M. And what it's going to do is multiply the site cost variable. The site cost variable is, in English, the unit cost of product P at site M multiplied by the amount XP at M. So mathematically, you'll, you'll, you'll identify that as the following. That's, you've essentially got two sums, one over the index P from 1, 2, 3, up to 4. Uh, sorry, up to 16, I should say. We've got 16 products. And M, 1, 2, 3, 4. And we're multiplying the site cost, subscript PM, multiplied by X PM. So it's just calculating the total cost of all your products at all your sites. And GAMS will expand that into a long linear function for you automatically. You don't need to um, do that. What that will translate into internally, if for those of you that are interested, will translate into um, the cost of product one at site one is 90. Right? So internally, that's going to translate into 90 times x11 plus 80 times x, well, let's take a look at our subscript, subscript p comma m, so product 2 at site 1, plus, and you get the idea, it just keeps going. Okay, So you'll have 16 times 4 entries in that sum. Okay, so it's a lot more efficient to use GAMS for this in that way. So here's an example that you can go, go copy and paste this code into GAMS and run it. Uh, the uh, current assignment you're working on, question one, gives you the GAMS code and asks you to interpret certain things from it. But if you go carefully look at that GAMS code, you'll see how sum and table are being used in that GAMS code. That subset of it. Is there a way to do it for uh, like multiple parts? Like if I wanted to do product one and two with all of the things, is there a way to do that? Yes. That? Yeah. Sum is a very, a very extensible function, right? So you can sum over only some indexes. In, you can put some constraints on which indexes are summed over and which are not. Okay. That gets messy, but it is a, it is possible to do it. Okay, so that just that gives you an idea of planning models, and then the current assignment uh, gets you working on that. So what I'd like you to do, um, maybe over here, is just take a few minutes and work through this example and set it up. This is 
deceptively simple, but it gives you an idea for a planning model. So I'll give you a chance to read through that problem and um, try to set up just the equations for it. Do you need one of these? Uh, sure. Have it at home. Okay. Anyone need a copy of that, this handout? The hardest part is to figure out what your search variables are.
Okay, so any suggestions on what the search variables sh should be? Yeah, Chris. Tons of oranges that you buy and tons of juice that juice concentrate that you buy. Okay, so X1 perhaps said as tons of oranges bought and X2 is is a tons of concentrate. Yeah. Okay, so given those, uh, what, would, what would you start to set up your objective function as? What entries would we expect in there? Okay, and then how, what are the costs? Uh, there's 200, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, 200x1. Oh, it is, yeah, and then uh, 1600x2. Minus 1600x2, okay. So income minus costs, costs, the cost per ton is given to us, so we can put that in there. Now, uh, the revenue is the part that we need to work on next. Um, so how much juice do we sell, right? So we get a certain amount of juice from the oranges and we get a certain amount of juice from the concentrate. Any suggestion on how those, those look and where those go? So maybe let's call revenue X3. Okay, so 0 0.3 x1 plus 2 times x2. So that's from a mass balance, right? So your tons of oranges get converted into this amount of juice. And your tons of concentrate gets converted into that amount of juice. So it's just a pure mass balance that you sub in over there. So revenue, that's x3 then maybe let's just specify that a little bit more carefully. That is amount of juice produced and then we can go finish up that objective function as 1500 times x3 okay so we've got a linear constraint in fact this is an equality constraint over here um, a linear objective function anything else that's missing yeah time the limit on x3 is we're required to produce at most 15,000 of that of x3 and for x1 we also have a constraint we can only purchase a certain a maximum amount of oranges x1 is less than equal to 10,000 okay we also have non-negativity constraints then on all the x's to round that off. Okay, so sub that into GANs and I'll let you solve it and uh, you can then see this is a planning problem. You're planning how many oranges to buy and how much concentrates to buy. So let's move on then to the last type of problem. I'm just going to give you a, a, an impression of what these last types of problems look like. These are scheduling problems. We will get back to this later on and you'll see why I'm delaying this uh, coming up. But a, a scheduling problem is the key distinction that differentiates it from the planning problems. Right? These are a little bit hard to sometimes distinguish. But a scheduling problem, the key distinction is that your work is fixed and you're just planning how you're going to do this work. Right? So think of a restaurant or a cafe. There's a certain number of hours that they're open for and they need to fix that that's fixed. And all they need to do is, is schedule who comes in and works for which shifts and for how long they work, right? So 
how many part-time workers do you use, how many full-time workers do you use, and you're doing that so that you maximize your profit. Right? So you're going to put um, part-time workers that cost you less, so you can put those, them on longer shifts. Full-time workers might cost you more because they have benefits, and so you put those on different shifts. So you're planning, or uh, sorry, you're scheduling, I should say, their, their work plan for them. Um, in companies here, the idea that we have when we're looking at scheduling is when we're buying feed, you can choose when to buy that feed. So you're scheduling it. We can say, well, I don't want to buy it in January. I will buy it in April when I know the prices are cheaper. And then I'm going to stockpile it in a storage and use that in July. Right? So rather than buy it now and store it and pay inventory costs, I might buy this later when it's cheaper and then use it up after that. So you're making a purchasing decision on when to buy. You've got constraints on how much you can store between zero and some maximum amount. Which factories to produce that product in. So there's a discrete decision there. Factory A, B, or C. And then when you ship from the factory, you might, you might make excess and store that in a warehouse. Other, other material that you produce, you go ship to customers right away. Right, so again, here's a storage capacity in that warehouse. Food companies do this regularly, right? So they're producing, like think of Doritos, right? They produce that in one big go. They stockpile it in a warehouse. Some of it is shipped to cover demand right away. Some of it is stored so that later on they can sell it to meet that demand. Um, so the reason why these problems become messy is because not only are you dealing with amounts, but you're dealing with time as well as a decision variable. And remember when I said we have x with subscripts, I, had, I was using pm. We're actually going to add another script, subscript here, pmt. You're going to choose the time period when you do this. Right? Your decision variable is going to be, for example, January, February, March, April, May. So it's not only the product at which site, but it's also when becomes a new search variable. So these, products quick, uh, these problems quickly explode into be fairly large and complicated. But we will get to one of these later on. OK, so I'm just giving you a hint for that. And the TAs actually are setting up an assignment question where you do this just for one period of time, and then they're going to challenge you to, to try it just on a second period of time. But we're going to start small and build it up in the next assignment. Okay, so that gives you the general flavor for it. But the set, the set of constraints are exactly the same that you've seen before. You've got constraints on storage, constraints on how much this factory can produce, and you've got demand and supplies on the products that you've got to meet. Okay, so that's something to, to look forward to. Let's uh, wrap up that linear programming section now, and I'm going to move on to the next topic.